Good. All right, I'd like to welcome our, our guest today, a uh, very special guest. Um, he's running an institution that's on the private side of things that we do. Uh, it's uh, Dean Ken Schwartz, who is the Dean of the School of Architecture of Tulane University. And uh, it's kind of interesting how Ken and I came together. Uh, I was chairing the New Orleans Public Library Board and uh, had a meeting with uh, Ken, not only just because of my library work, but also serve on a New Orleans Redevelopment Authority, authority and was telling Ken that, you know, architecture is such an important piece uh, in New Orleans. People call it, uh, you know, one of the three of the Holy Trinity, music, food, and architecture, one of the things that uh, three things that makes New Orleans so great, that I was uh, really uh, ask, asking Ken to invest kind of in a layman uh, or a novice uh, or amateur approach to architecture uh, because really a lot of folks who are amateurs or novices really have the largest effect on architecture in the city. Uh, and so Ken took me up on my offer and uh, made me a member of his advisory board for the Tulane School of Architecture, which I've been learning a tremendous amount uh, from Ken, Ken about, but also agreed to come here uh, all the way from the other part of town, all the way from uptown, across Canal Street, <laughs> uh, to come talk to you guys today. And what I hope that you guys can gain from this is kind of a view uh, that architecture is not something that's only for architects. Architecture is something that's for each and every one of us. We understand that with our culinary artists, we understand that with music, and I'm hoping uh, today Ken can reinforce uh, the this perspective for us really with architecture. So without further ado, I'd like to welcome our guest, Ken Schwartz. Thank you. I'll uh, say a few words of introduction, then I'm going to sh show some slides that'll um, help you understand a little bit about the issues that I think are significant about architecture today, especially in New Orleans. Um, I've only been here for two years. I came here to become the Dean of the School of Architecture just a little over two years ago after more than 20 years of teaching at the University of Virginia, which is another public institution. So I'm very familiar with the important role that public education plays for women and men in our country and beyond. Uh, I came here for many of the same reasons that uh, Tulane students and many other people come to New Orleans. I know Tulane very well since I've been there for two years. I don't know the composition of University of New Orleans as a student body, but I was very interested in how the nonprofit organizations, neighborhoods, community groups, citizen activists like Irvin and many others, the faith-based communities, how they have come together since Katrina to bring a, a series of opportunities to the fore for this community in response to the disaster of Katrina, but also with new possibilities that emerged as a result of that disaster. So I arrived on the scene three years after the storm in a private institution that had fundamentally changed its identity as a result of the challenges created by Katrina and the needs of this community. Um, I come from a background of citizen activism myself. I was on the city planning commission in my community for five years. I was a member of the board of architectural review, which is like the Vieux-Carré Commission or the HDLC here in New Orleans. I was on a gubernatorial board appointed by the governor of Virginia for a similar sort of oversight role of investment in buildings and spaces, public spaces in the Commonwealth of Virginia. So I was a professor, a practicing architect, and also someone who was very interested, as is Irvin, in how I could make some contributions in the world around me. So for me, the idea, and for my wife, who is also an, an architect, the idea of coming to New Orleans at that moment in time, at this moment in time, was especially important for us. And as it's turned out, it's been an extremely productive two years. Tulane has done a lot of very good work already, and I think we're accelerating the work that we do in the community. So some of what I'm going to show you here, a lot of what I'm showing you, is really not my work at all. It's the work of the students and the faculty at the School of Architecture and the way that they've responded by bringing their talents and their intellects to bear on some very serious needs within this community. For me, architecture is a social art. It is a political art. It's something that requires an architect to take a stand on whatever terms make sense in the given project at hand. It'll vary from a library commission to a hospital to a residence, but at, at its core, an architect needs to understand his or her place in society. 
And you may have remembered a moment ago that I said I came from the University of Virginia. That is the only university in the country designed by a president, Thomas Jefferson, who was also an architect. And interestingly, Thomas Jefferson has on his tombstone three accomplishments. He designed his own tombstone, of course. It's an obelisk. And he cites three things. He, of course, did many, many things during his long lifetime. But the three things that he identifies are author of the Declaration of Independence, author of the Virginia Statute on Religious Freedom, which is the precursor to the separation of church and state in our Constitution, and founder of the University of Virginia. Notice that he doesn't mention that he was a president, a vice president, secretary of state, uh, um, founding father more generally, not just as author of the Declaration. So here is a man who cites as one of his three major accomplishments the creation of university as a design problem. Not only as an architectural design problem, but as a whole new conception of what public education could mean for the new republic. Uh, he is one of my heroes. Uh, he is someone who actually brought together broad ideas of culture through the lens of architecture, through the lens of politics, and a series of radical ideas that were radical for his day and time. So I, I've studied him for many, many years. Uh, students at that institution certainly study him, and he's left an amazing legacy. I should also note that the other two documents, Virginia Statute for Religious Freedom and the Declaration of Independence, are also design problems. How do you design a vision of government that's equitable? How do you create a break from the remote tyranny of George III? And this is a guy who saw design opportunities at every challenge that was in front of him and used them from the very, very fine-grained scale of inventions that he did for his own house at Monticello to the broad scale of helping to create a new nation out of the tyranny of Great Britain at the time. So um, I think architecture is political. I think it has real meaning in society. My sense is that some people get it. Irvin certainly gets it. He's practicing this idea through his own civic activism, through his own citizenship that he exercises within this community. It's one of the things that attracted me to his work immediately. Um, we can find people like Irvin in cities all across the country. And they're important people within communities, oftentimes uh, uh, heralded for their contributions and sometimes overlooked at many different scales within communities. So I want to show you a little bit about uh, what we're doing as a snapshot, and it really speaks to the issue of civic engagement, which is very important to us at Tulane right now, and it's important to me personally. It's one of the things that I hope I will help to accelerate within the School of Architecture during my tenure as dean. So with that, I'm going to show you some pictures, and some of this will be familiar to you because it's actually the history of this city. Oh, one thing, we um, got some notice recently as one of the top design schools in the country. That's nice. Uh, it's always nice to have a pat on the head. Uh, and uh, we are <laughs> referred to at Tulane, if you look carefully here, as one of the hidden gems of architectural education. What that means is that we're not in the top 10. Uh, I'd like to be in the top 10. But we are recognized for the innovative work that we're doing, particularly in the area of social entrepreneurship, civic activism, sustainability, and helping this community to realize a future, a better future through the built and natural environment. So I'm going to, uh, can you see these slides? It's a little bit faded, but that, of course, is the Mississippi coursing around the uh, Pont Lake Pontchartrain at the top. And I'm going to give you just a quick snapshot of some of the historical issues that underlie the work that we're doing and so many other people are doing in this community. Of course, it, it relates to the fact that we are below sea level, at least significant portions of the city are below sea level, which in itself, historically, was not such a serious problem. It was a huge problem with the failure of the levees, and you all know the story of this. But if you look at this map with the so-called sliver by the river, the high ground along the Mississippi River, where over thousands of years the Mississippi would spill its bank and drop its deposit and create a landform that was actually above sea level, as opposed to this line here, which is the zero elevation line. Zero means sea level. So that in a perfect world, if you had the worst flood in the world, forget about the levees for a second, at worst, you'd get a flood that would go to this point, and then it would recede over time, which is how the swamps historically operated as an ecosystem. That whole situation changed with the advent of pumps and levees, and all of a sudden, we had a new set of challenges on our hands, which failed us during Hurricane Katrina. That map, as an abstraction, shows you the extent of development in the year 2000. The darker areas represent 
heavier, denser areas of development. And the pattern of development historically has always followed this reality of New Orleans, which is that there has been high ground and lower ground. Traditionally, higher ground was for higher income people. Lower ground was for lower income people, for having to do, having to do with property values, discrimination in some cases, and in many other factors that were at play. But this expression, sliver by the river, really speaks to a historical adaptation and pattern of how New Orleans developed over its several hundred year history. This is a very familiar story, much more familiar to folks here than me as a newcomer two years ago, but I followed this like the rest of the country with horror and with shame that this could happen to us in this country at this moment in time. That is the extent of the flooding. And of course, because of the failures, it couldn't exercise its normal flow of receding which is how floods occurred uh, before the advent of the, of the pumping stations, that you would have flooding any time there was a very heavy rain, a hurricane that went by, that was fine. The ecosystem and the way of life and the raised houses were all ad adaptations to accommodate that reality of our lives in this kind of situation. Now the Tulane City Center has, um, we formed the Tulane City Center following Hurricane Katrina as a way for this small private institution uptown to try to position itself to be able to do good work in the community. It's, it's kind of like a, a, a nonprofit arm within the nonprofit University of Tulane. That its goal, its mission is to take on projects that have significance and relevance, some very small in scale and some larger in scale as you'll see. And I am very privileged to be part of a group of students and faculty who have been working on these issues now for five years. And my job has been to take the accomplishments that I found when I got here two years ago and figure out how I can help to expand those opportunities and scale for our students and ultimately for the community. So the Tulane City Center is partly about research, it's off the edge of the slide here, partly about outreach, it involves preservation, we deal with grants, we have a lot of uh, foundation money that has come in to allow us to do our work. I'll give you one example of how we work. Um, I secured a million dollar grant uh, which is going to pay out $100,000 a year for the next 10 years. We just started our first one this year. And we send an RFP, a request for proposals, out to nonprofit organizations throughout New Orleans to compete for the opportunity to work with us and to take our money. And we provide the money, we provide the faculty and students who connect up with the nonprofit community or organization, a specific organization, to do a project, a project of their choosing. Uh, one of the first projects we're doing right now is the Guardians of the Flame, which is um, an organization that's trying to restore and preserve the legacy of the Mardi Gras Indian tradition and having a great deal of difficulty doing so if they do not pass down that tradition from generation to generation, those memories eventually are lost. So we have an architect, Scott Ruff, and a group of students who are working with this organization and with our money to create some sort of a uh, museum or center or some facility that allows them to preserve their history going forward. Uh, the reality of this, this small font, but the reality of what we're dealing with is somewhere over 200,000 uh, homes in this area, in this region, substantially damaged or destroyed. A huge demand, a huge need to work. Now what we decided to do as a matter of ethics or value within our school is that we're very much concentrating on the area within the community that's somewhere near the zero sea level line, the zero foot elevation. Above that elevation, if you drop uh, a drop of water, it'll flow down eventually to sea level. Uh, below that, you're below sea level, so on a heavy rain, you're going to be under some water at that point, naturally or normally. So our projects, these little dots, are for the most part somewhere in the zone between the maximum limit of the flood and zero foot. And the reason for that is fairly simple. Those are properties that are generally affordable. They're lower income neighborhoods. The properties are within reach of many folks who might not be able to afford property elsewhere on higher ground. And yet they're not so low that they are truly um, vulnerable in ways that, that we, we think it's safer to be somewhere in that zone right around zero foot. And most of our work is in that area. Um, we're probably most notable for a series of houses that we built, one a year in Central City. One is actually in Treme, but um, these are called urban build houses. 
They were featured on a Sundance Channel TV series called Architecture School. You saw that you saw the show? Yeah, the Red House is the one that was featured in a TV series. Uh, we didn't make the TV series. We were the subjects of the documentary. But uh, the same guy that did the, um, uh, what is it called? The, no, it's like the queer eye for the straight guy or something like that. Something like that. Uh, he, uh, the, the same guy that, that did that series did this house series. And it's a great series pointing out a whole year's process of how our students and faculty working with the neighborhood created this house and designed it in the fall semester and built it in the spring semester. And they've done that on each of these houses. All of these houses are very contemporary, but they're all based on shotgun or camelback or traditional house forms that are found throughout uh, this, uh, this city. I mean, really, that's the dominant house type throughout. So they may not look like a traditional gabled shotgun, but they're organized in the same linear fashion in our same tight sites that we see throughout the whole city. So we're well known for this. Our students are doing this every semester. It's part of our curriculum. So we'll do, we're doing this, and we're doing many other projects at the same time. But these alone, this is in Treme. This is for, was sold to a, a New Orleans police officer named Timothy. And it has a, a porch. It doesn't look like a traditional New Orleans porch, but it's an interpretation of the porch where people hang out, stay out of the sun, and have a whole kind of social interaction between the private realm of the house itself and the public realm of the street. This is a great New Orleans tradition, and it continues with these houses that our students have designed and built. It's maybe a little hard to read this sectional perspective, <coughs> but they did something really smart. To get up to safe level, they had to go up that high, but the students thought that that was too high for the porch. So they did the porch as an intermediate level, as a progression from the street up to that safe level above uh, the flood line. And I think it was a very inventive and simple technique to make a house work and to, to accommodate the needs at the same time. Uh, this is a, a traditional shotgun double on the bottom with a, a wall in between and, and, and fireplaces between the two houses. Each house runs from front to back with the porch in the front. And our house was kind of a version of that that slipped off center but does many of the same things that the traditional house does. The guy with the sunglasses there and the goatee is Byron Mouton. Uh, I guess there are a lot of Moutons in uh, South Louisiana. He's one of them. And Byron is the Pied Piper of uh, Urban Build. He leads the whole project as our faculty member. He's also an architect and contractor at the same time. And those are our students setting up framing and actually building the house in the neighborhood. This one's in Central City. And that's a view of the kitchen, which is, uh, you know, they're, they're tight houses. They're affordable. They're workforce housing, uh, meaning that they sell for anywhere from $125,000 to $140,000. And our students are the ones who make this happen and, and some additional uh, outside support that we bring in to make it happen as well, financially. There's Timothy. Uh, the neighborhood was thrilled when Timothy moved in because he parks his cruiser in front. And uh, that has a good effect on the neighborhood. There's Byron. I love this picture because Byron is... Uh, a vision of calm amidst a storm that's around him and the storm of the students here but also anybody who's dealt with contracting knows that there's all sorts of unexpected things that come up uh, any number of things can go wrong and he's just as calm as can be and really knowledgeable about how to do his business yes sure of course it is it's very observant. This, this is actually the front door, and it's down at okay. this level, obviously. Cool. Then and that's the rest of the house at that upper level. So it overlooks the porch. Okay. But it does open wide in order to get the air going through it. Okay. And I, I think that was a very inventive approach by the students to get more ventilation and more openness back to the street, which is not, I mean, actually, you see that in some New Orleans houses as well, where the, you get the really tall windows that open up to the porch and the street. So there's Byron and our students. They're busy designing over a board. That's up in our studios up at Tulane. It's a different house um, <coughs> that has two different forms that overlap like that. And an example of a historical house that has its uh, traditional relationship, a camelback. I love this picture because we, we experiment with different building systems. This is a steel stud system as opposed to wood studs. And uh, it's all pre-assembled, then lifted up. It's very lightweight. 
But I like it because it's almost like a religious experience. They're sort of seeing God as they lift this uh, thing up into the air. Framing. I mean, the students look at, learn an enormous amount about some fundamental issues of how architecture works. It's not just an abstract profession. We actually build things and get things done. Architects normally don't do the building. We do the drawings and the models and the specifications and the vision. Others usually build our projects, but there's no substitute for a student to get hands-on experience. It's very humbling. It's, uh, it makes them realize that their details have meaning and have very specific <coughs> significance to the contractors who actually do the constructions on the sites. That's the, the final version. That's in Central City. Now, just a few blocks off of St. Charles uh, um, Lakeside. This is when they were filming us. They just took over the building for a year. Well, actually half a year. And they just, you know, after about the first week or so, the students and faculty just ignored the film crew because they're just busy doing their work and they have boom mics. In the end, they were on this uh, six-part, half-hour TV series. You can still buy it off of uh, iTunes. I don't get Sundance Channel, which is where it appeared. So I just bought it by, um, by uh, downloading it, 995. We don't get any of that money. I'm not making a pitch. Uh, this is, uh, uh, we experimented with another system called SIPs, which is um, structurally insulated panels. Are any of you involved in construction or have been any experience? SIPs is a very efficient system where it has um, the insulation and the panels sort of melded together as one piece. It's environmentally very, very efficient, and it's also quick to put up because they come in big panels all preassembled. This is a wood SIPs panel here. They're, they're digging the foundations. This was part of the TV series, too. Those are the panels being delivered on the site. They go up really quickly because they're large increments and they're not too heavy. Two, two or three students can prop them up together. There, there you see them propping them up in place. And it's a slightly odd house. Uh, it's right on the corner. I think it's on the corner of Dryads and 7th, if I'm not mistaken. And, uh, very tight site. It's an unusual site, shorter than most. We've done five houses. We've not had a single incidence of vandalism or any problems with our students working in the neighborhoods. And the reason is that we, we help to build community. We're involved in the community. We don't just pop in and pop out. Uh, our students are very much uh, learning how to work with the neighborhoods, very diverse neighborhoods, neighborhoods in this case that actually have some crime problems and uh, a lot of unemployment. But they sort of watch our back, and it's been a very successful collaboration thus far, and I think it will continue to be. We're very much concentrating on this neighborhood because we figure if we do a house a year, over time, that whole neighborhood is going to have a different, a different spirit, and I think that's already the case. That's a little postcard. We had an open house where we invited everybody from the neighborhood to celebrate the completion of the house. This house is sold now as well. We had information, barbecue, uh, music, lots of fun. Uh, that woman actually is an architect that works for Neighborhood Housing Services, which is the nonprofit organization that we collaborate with. Neighborhood Housing Services places the owners, helps them with credit, uh, mortgages, and gets them into the houses. We, we design and build the houses. They take care of the issues of placement and selection of who gets to buy these things. It's also, the porches are great for speeches. This was a speech, an impromptu speech. Really nice on the inside, ceiling fans, high ceilings. This is just how we do our design work in the School of Architecture. The students pin up their work, and they're critiqued by architects, contractors, neighborhood folks, people from neighborhood housing services. And you can see there's a crowd around there trying to understand various options and issues that the student's trying to pursue. Uh, this is actually our most recent house in, in um, Central City. And it, it looks a little severe, but it, those panels are um, a synthetic material that actually operate as hurricane shutters. They're designed in so that those panels can close up the house in the case of an approaching hurricane very easily. They slide right into place and then uh, uh, screw into place. The woman that, that bought this house, single woman, has a company that does organization. She's the kind of person who goes in and you can hire her and she'll organize your entire life. 
I need her. <laughs> some details of the house. Anyway, there's some of the shutters closing. And it, op it also opens wide open, so that becomes a porch back to the street. That's on the corner of, I think, 7th and Saratoga. She's also mobilized the kids in the neighborhood. She's become a, a real sort of leader of the kids. She's in her probably early 30s, but she's really good with kids. And the kids have taken on a whole neighborhood beautification project, planting trees and taking care of vacant properties themselves. So she's become kind of a neighborhood-based citizen activist for her neighborhood. And she throws great parties, too. That's her back porch in the green slide on the left, on the upper left. So we do more than just houses. You'll see, oh, there's our students who built the house. This is a party she threw for the students to thank them for building it. And uh, Emily Taylor is the woman on the right. She works for me. She's the, the job superintendent who does most of the construction oversight for us at the Tulane City Center. And um, there's Byron again with his goatee. Sam is another staff person. The rest of these are all students from Tulane. Now, we do a lot of other projects. This is a really interesting. Have any of you heard of Cornerstones? It's in collaboration with a professor here at UNO, uh, Rachel, and I forget Rachel's last name. It's, a, it's kind of an oral history project, trying to capture the history of various important places in the memory or memories of New Orleans. A lot of these relate to music and bars and areas that if they weren't documented and captured through uh, recorded histories and place-based histories, they might disappear from everyone's consciousness and memory. So in this book and website called Cornerstones, there's a documentation of the relationship between architecture and culture more broadly, very often related to music. Not always just music, but that's one of the kind of common themes that courses through it. And these are, you know, I read this before I came to New Orleans, and I thought this is the best history of New Orleans I've read because it's sort of snapshots of various sort of micro traditions that it populate our landscape, our urban landscape. They're so fundamental to this place's collective identity. And for a newcomer like me, it gave a really interesting insight into this place that I never had read about, heard about, or heard spoken about before. It's all probably familiar to folks who live here, but for a newcomer or for someone who's worried about maintaining that history, it's very, import it's very important work. They all have a specific place, and we document that place. Many of them are on corners, which is a great New Orleans tradition. Now, I'm winding down here, but you know, we've got a huge array of projects. We've done work in the Vietnamese community. Uh, New Orleans East, we did a project that helped them to visualize how they could re-inhabit their flooded landscape with urban farms, with low-density housing, and really picking up on their traditions, really all, going all the way back to the Mekong Delta, of how they lived in a particular uh, ecological context. Um, that project by our students won a National Design Award, and it's a very cohesive community. Uh, so we're hopeful that that project's going to help influence how they re-inhabit their area of the community as is the case in Central City in a different way as well. Uh, we've also collaborated with architects and architecture schools all across the country. Because we're here, because we have credibility in neighborhoods, we're able to match make between people who want to do something in this area but wouldn't know where to begin and to try to give them access to nonprofit organizations, neighborhood groups, and other partners that can actually help to do something good for this community through architecture and through design. So um, my privilege as a dean is that I get to celebrate in the successes of our students and faculty and to help find <coughs> resources to make this possible. And uh, these are the th we have a grand total of three staff people who have done 60 projects so far since Hurricane Katrina. We've had over 300 students involved in these projects and over 30 faculty just from Tulane alone, not counting the people from across the country. And these three, Scott Bernard is the director. He's a professor of architecture and a uh, fantastic guy, great teacher. This guy's name's Dan Etheridge. He's an Australian crazy man. And uh, he's really an ecologist. He's not an architect, but he's very connected within the community. His wife is the professor here at UNO, uh, Rachel, and I'm drawing a blank on her last name. She's an anthropologist here. And then Emily, you saw a moment ago, she's the construction superintendent for most of our design build projects throughout the community. She is also a graduate of our graduate program in architecture at Tulane, and she decided to stay here because she wanted to be part of the rebuilding process. Now, 
the main point I want to emphasize, and it's the issue that motivates me, is that uh, architecture is, means a lot of different things to a lot of people. It's a high art. If you think about architecture, let's say like Frank Gehry, or um, uh, oh, back in the old days, uh, Frank Lloyd Wright. These are architects who are great artists and very important to the cultural landscape of our country in many different ways. And they are significant figures in their own right. But I think there's a trend in architectural education, and certainly it's true at Tulane University, that sees the role of the architect as something that includes high aspirations for beauty, but also is driven by some real motivations for social relevance, that architecture is used as one of many tools to contribute to a better world. And I know that motivates our students. That's why we're getting amazing students at Tulane. And it's really, I think, what's propelling us forward and, and shaping our identity as an institution. And so I get to participate in that process. I get to meet people like Irvin as a result of coming here. And I'm, I'm really excited about this moment in time. I think it is a unique moment in history. And we may look back on this 10, 20 years from now and realize that there was a kind of cusp where people are thinking about architecture in broader terms as an engine for positive change within communities like New Orleans. So with that, I'd be happy to slide over here. How about it for Ken Schwartz? Thanks. That was such a thorough presentation. I think that I'm going to take uh, Dean Schwartz straight through uh, a little thing I do with all of my guests. I do somewhat of a word association sure. and kind of a prose questionnaire. <coughs> so I give you something, and you give me the first thing that comes to your mind. He's springing this on me. <laughs> You're going to do just fine. Tulane University. Engaged. The University of New Orleans. Important public institution. Architecture. Beauty. Food. Delicious. Music. Inspiring. The New Orleans Saints. Who dat? Governor Bobby Jindal. Did I get that right? <laughs> yes. Someone passed me uh, after the most recent victory, and they yelled who dat at me, and I didn't respond the way you're supposed to respond, and she was really mad at me, so I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm working on it. I'm sorry. Governor Bobby Jindal. Up the river. Mitch Landrew. He's got it. The New Orleans City Council. I don't know. <laughs> what is your favorite word? Imagining. What is your least favorite word? Discrimination. What turns you on creatively, spiritually, or emotionally? Cities. What turns you off? Close-minded people. What is your favorite curse word? <laughs> Does he ask this of everyone? Uh, my most favorite or my least favorite? Your favorite oh, curse favorite. word. Uh, it starts with an S and it ends with a T. <laughs> <laughs> what sound or noise do you love? Uh, I love my daughter's laugh. What sound or noise do you hate? Guns. What profession other than your own would you like to attempt? Politics. What profession would you like not to do? Accounting. <laughs> Went if, bad at it. If heaven exists, what would you like to hear God say when you arrive at the pearly gates? If heaven exists, what would I like God to say when I enter the pearly gates? A question. So let's go ahead and open this up for some questions. I would like to leave with one question before we open up uh, with our students. Uh, and just a little bit of 
you know, we have a lot of folks in here who have very different majors. What would be your suggestion or recommendation for them to be involved in something that I like in architecture to jazz or opera, that if you're not in it, you have, if you haven't intersected with it, it can uh, have an allure of being intimidating. And for a lot of people, the beauty of it, the magic of it, or the, uh, the opportunity of it eludes <coughs> a lot of them. So what would be your recommendation or suggestions for them to be involved more? I, I, th I think it, uh, you can get involved in just about anything. And I think the key issues, at least from my standpoint, are persistence. Uh, I, I've seen many, many students who have tried to get involved in things and run into some frustrations or haven't stuck with it quite enough and they either then move on to something else or they just don't quite get out of that experience what they could. And it could be anything from volunteerism within the community to my, one of my daughters now is a, an RA in her dormitory, which takes persistence because you've got to stick with it for at least a year. She's doing it for two years. And by staying with something and actually applying yourself, inevitably you get more engaged with the issue at hand, whatever that issue might be. And you tend to find things out about yourself that only time allows. So that, that would be my advice, is, is get into anything. I mean, almost anything that requires you to be more than yourself is going to give you that kind of um, in it and, and within it aspect that's essential. And without it, you're really just skirting the surface. All right, let's open up some questions for me. Yes. Being at a uh, private institution, you don't have to deal with the issues of the budget cuts of higher education, but what do you feel about these budget cuts, and do you see any repercussions happening at your school because of it? I'm, I'm really worried about the, the budget situation, not just here, and I've been reading about it here specifically, but also really nationwide. Almost every state except South Dakota maybe, North Dakota, one of those states has oil money or gas money or something, and they're doing just fine. But um, every, almost every state in the country has been cutting higher education and many other things that I consider to be essential. And let me put it this way. Um, during my lifetime, I was born in 1957, so you can do the math. We um, found ourselves in a position where we were threatened by the possibility of the Soviet Union accelerating beyond us in terms of their capability in science and engineering. The Sputnik uh, event caused this country to recognize that we had to invest in research and in education. And if we didn't do that, we would become a second tier country relative to our foe in the Cold War, the Soviet Union. And the success of our response to that challenge was phenomenal. And it played out in terms of the moonshot, in terms of semiconductor industries, in terms of medical research and, and revolutions in healthcare. All of that is traceable to invest public investment in the education of young women and men, period. As a country, for some reason, we can't realize that these investments now that ultimately pay off 10, 20 years down the road through all of you uh, represent a huge an important commitment by, this, by this, um, this country that is sort of passing us by. I'm very worried about it. Private institutions in some ways are insulated uh, because we're driven by tuition and research dollars and philanthropy for the most part. So Tulane is not subjected to the same forces that you are. We've got other forces that we worry about. But I think those of us who care about higher education have to care about public education because of its great tradition in the United States going all, all the way back to the 19th century with land-grant institutions. So I attended Cornell University, which is half private, half public, and the public entities of Cornell are very much like the public entities here or any place else that represents the public's commitment to the future through, through women and men who come through the system. So I don't know what's going to turn it around. For me, this country seems to respond to crises and only when an issue gets to be a point of absolute crisis do we then respond. And I think that's a failure of political leadership and a failure on the part of all of us who vote. Yes? Um, so I was wondering if I've, I've been hearing about different options that I'm not sure if architecture would have anything to do with this, but um, I mean, it, it might. With I've heard about Mr. Goh and, uh, and how they're thinking about different options of having protection against flooding and 
since it's or working with water, um, there's some sort of option three where they base it off of Holland, where they have lots of waterways that allow like flow and ebb. And um, I was wondering if, uh, if your depart, if, if your school was sort of working since flooding is such a major deal, why you build different houses and different projects? Yeah, that's a great question. The Tulane is very involved. As is, as is Xavier, and I, I don't know if UNO is involved in this in the same way. I know you've got a great planning department here, but um, in the School of Architecture, we have connections that are dealing with the issues of wetlands restoration on the one hand, but also how do you manage the water? Water is a reality here, and, and just like in the Netherlands, we have to be smarter about the way we make water part of our lives. One of the fundamental problems that we experienced here in New Orleans, really it's nationwide, but it's more acute here in New Orleans because of the elevations and because of the history of the last hundred years, is that we wanted to kind of get water out of the way as quickly as possible. We wanted to put it in pipes. We wanted to pump it away, rather than trying to deal with it as a visible reality in our day-to-day -day lives. Um, we've been involved in something called the Dutch Dialogues. Not just us, but a number of other partners have been involved. The American Planning Association has been one of the key leaders of this nationwide. They've come here. Dutch engineers have come here. Our architects and community designers have been involved in a three-part series of visits trying to see how the example from the Netherlands can work here. And I mention this because in a month I'm going to be going to the Netherlands with Senator Landrieu, who is leading a congressional delegation on exactly this point. And she has been a real leader. Uh, she is interested in this issue. Uh, it's helpful that she and the mayor have, uh, you know, a good relationship as well. And I, I actually have some hope that we can make some major strides at the large scale, the regional scale of what we're doing with water, and then at the very fine grain scale of how you actually manage water on specific sites as you develop property in a place like New Orleans. You know, the old mindset of civil engineering was that you get the water off a site quickly and, and put it somewhere else. The new mindset is that maybe you should slow down that water and maybe let it absorb back into the ground, which is what actually made New Orleans' whole ecosystem work in the first place. Water came in, water uh, filtered down, and, and while we've been on a great job of engineering all that water away, not so great when we saw Katrina hit, it's had the effect of subsidence where the ground level has gone down in some places in the city 10 or 12 feet from its natural position. I was told by, by Rich Campanella, who is one of the great uh, scholars of the ecosystem, shall we say, of this area, that for the most part, this whole area north of the zero elevation line that I showed you on that map was almost exactly at sea level through its prehistory, the pre-human history or pre-Western history of arrival on this continent. And what happened was the Mississippi would flood. Lake Pontchartrain would sometime wash up when there were uh, low pressure systems and it was spinning the right way. And all of that would slowly move away or slowly subside into the muck. And it maintained a certain balance of elevation as a result of that. You pull that water away and eventually the ground starts to drop. It's like a sponge that's getting all the water squeezed out of it. So we've set in motion a problem that was about 100 years in the making, maybe more than 100 years. And now we're going to have to slowly turn that problem around. And I, I think it's possible to do so, but it's going to take patience and time and a lot of money to do it. The Dutch have been invent, investing significant billions of dollars of money for more than 100 years in the opposite direction of how they would manage, really a couple hundred years of how they more gently manage their water problem. And most of that country is below sea level. So we're going there for four or five days with a group from Washington, a number of leaders from New Orleans and uh, Baton Rouge. And there is a, a kind of common understanding that we must deal with this. It is a crisis. And uh, you can have debates about global warming and about whether sea levels are rising or not. Even if you don't think sea levels are rising, we've got a problem that we've got to be dealing with. And it's a design problem at a number of different levels with heavy engineering implications as well. So I think it's one of the exciting moments right now. It's terrible that we've had to uh, go through the history that we have. But it has had the effect of causing people to realize, you know, Republicans and Democrats alike, that this is an issue. And it's an issue that matters to us a great deal, and it matters to all of South Louisiana. I think it should matter for the whole country, because this is such a 
treasure for, for, the, for the United States that, you know, this can't not be dealt with. Next question. Yes, ma'am. Um, I see through the school's publication, Cornerstone, that you have recognized the cultural gem of mother-in-law. Um, I've been friends with Betty Fox, the daughter of uh, Antoinette and Ernie Cato. Um, over the summer, um, I helped her put on a couple of events to help save it. Um, it's, it's a really dire shape, and she's about to lose it. And I was wondering if you had any suggestions or could put me in touch with somebody that you know, could do something. I don't, but I bet Rachel would. So I'll be happy to give you my card after this class. You send me an email, and I'll find Rachel's last name. I'm embarrassed that I can't remember her last name. Pardon me? I believe you're talking about Rachel Ward. I'm not sure. There's a Martha Ward. I thought it started with a B. She involved the Neighborhood Story Project. Yeah. It's Brunlin or something like that. Thank you. Uh, That's her name. Brunlin? See, I was, I was close. Brunlin. Brunlin. It is with a B, and I got that right. But, but she's the person you should contact. She actually probably knows the answer to that question. And uh, a lot of the prop projects that they were looking at or issues they were looking at were ones that were in some form of jeopardy, and that's part of the purpose. But you can all find this if you haven't seen it already. It's Cornerstones. Just do a Google search. You'll find it, the web presence of that same project. It's very impressive. And it's a whole line of anthropological research that's, I think, extremely important because it's capturing contemporary history. And if they weren't capturing it, it, it could disappear. There's a, a great uh, writer from the early part of the 20th century a French writer who wrote that collective memory uh, involved, well, the way he put it is that history starts when memory dies. That what we all know to be traditional writing of history, the official histories that you read in books, actually is a result of failure of us as a social construct to understand our collective memory as, as, a, as a community. And it's, it's absolutely true with some of these uh, treasured places within this community and true for other cities as well. So these projects are really important projects, and I think your children and grandchildren will be able to look at these, whether they have continued or whether they've disappeared, as an important part of the landscape here. Next question. Did you get um, public buildings uh, ever, like, for, oh wait, this is your first year, right, the grant thing? So. Uh, oh, oh, what's your question? I was going to ask, like, do you only do houses and, like, private buildings, or do you, are you or you're open to anything, like if someone proposes an idea for like a cultural center or something like that? The, uh, the, the new program that we're doing where we do one project every year with this grant money, mm -hmm. that has to be a nonprofit organization. And if you're not yet a nonprofit, we'll help you become a nonprofit. In other words, it's not for private sector use or for individuals, really. It's for organizations, usually small scale New Orleans organizations that are trying to do something within their communities. One of our real success stories right now, I didn't show it, but have any of you been to Hollygrove Farmer's Market? Uh, it's pretty amazing. And that started, we started that project with the, the Neighborhood Development Corporation, the Community Development Corporation. That started about two and a half years ago. And it started with a master plan for an abandoned property that was badly flooded from the storm and trying to reclaim this old commercial nursery and turn it into a neighborhood resource, a, a neighborhood garden. And it's not just a garden, it's a place where the Holly Grove Farmers and Growers Market can show neighborhood folks how to farm, do an urban farm in a healthy way, organically, uh, worrying, you know, being careful with the soil, that you're not building on uh, problematic soil and so on. Now it's this thriving market that's really become a catalyst for the Holly Grove neighborhood. And they're just up and running. I was, up, I was over there just a couple days ago. I had the Chinese National Television uh, network, the, the top network in China, came over to film our students and the Holly Grove Center and one of our other projects. And it's just amazing. They're, they grow all these uh, beautiful little vegetables, sell them to expensive restaurants, and folks are actually using it as a small-scale economic development engine where they're actually making money out of these deals. And you get a lot of kids and older folks who are growing really good food. And of course, in New Orleans, there's always a market for really good food. Next question. Yes. Um, do you feel that the HDLC is um, a little too restrictive to really benefit the neighborhoods that it serves, or are you real familiar with it and how it 
how they how they operate. I mean, I've renovated two houses that were governed by that, and it, the things that I would have felt were hugely historic and should not be changed, they didn't care about. And some of the things that they found untouchable were things that, that really seemed to have, in the greater scale, absolutely no, no historical or really um, architectural value to the houses. How many of you know what HDLC is? Just picking up on this, you know it already. It's the Historic District Landmarks Commission. That's the, I think that's what it stands for. Mm -hmm. And I have to confess, I don't actually, I haven't observed them in action yet, and I haven't been involved with them yet. But I know exactly where your question's coming from, because as I said, I served on the exact same kind of board in Charlottesville, which is just as conscious of its history as New Orleans is here. And uh, your observation's very fitting for Charlottesville. Uh, sometimes citizens who are really trying to do the right thing come before the board and they encounter this weird uh, flip that you just described. It can seem um, quixotic, you know, arbitrary in the way that the boards operate. I can tell you that I joined that board in part to try to bring balance to that very question. My board had seven people on it and only two of us were architects. And more often than not, I think the architects on the board were helping to try to, to balance the discussion so that the board was operating legitimately in the realm that they should, which is really primarily, at least in Charlottesville, dealing with issues of massing and scale and appropriateness, quote unquote. But the appropriateness can be pushed in a number of different directions. Um, my, my main advice is get involved in the HDLC as a member of the commission, if you can, because you can actually make a difference as one voice on a commission like this. And um, uh, I think also, I don't know how to explain it here in New Orleans because I haven't seen it, but it is a common challenge of these boards. On the other hand, having them in place is very important because in the absence of any kind of controls, uh, all sorts of odd things can happen that are really problematic for homeowners and other businesses and others who are invested in their communities. We used to get a lot of fights in Charlottesville whenever we would expand a district whenever you propose a larger historic district, a lot of times the folks from the uh, business community will come out and say, well, you're intruding on my property rights and you're hurting my property values and so on. But there's actually a lot of studies from the National Trust for the Historic Preservation and other entities that have looked at how property values actually increase in value if they have the certitude of design controls within those historic districts, which actually stands to reason that if you're gonna be investing in your house, you don't really want someone either tearing down a potentially valuable property next to you arbitrarily or doing something really, really inappropriate with it as a historical property. And to add a little value to that statement, uh, three things that affect us all. One, I think when we're talking about neighborhood engineering, uh, one of the challenges you have is when you have an organization like this, you buy a house. I just recently purchased a house and the people come in and say, well, you can't do this, you can't do that. And a lot of it you don't find out until after you've spent your money. So, I did. Someone that asked you to ask you that question. <laughs> Across the street neighbor, as a matter of fact. They're watching me. I didn't know it was my house. <laughs> uh, but, you know, you come in and so you may have one set of ideas of some things you want to get done and now you find out you can't do the things that you first imagined. So that's quite irritating right. to you if you're a homeowner. Second thing is you have things happen like Louis Armstrong, uh, the most, uh, I would say, substantial artist for American uh, musical culture. He's you know, kind of the face of it. He brought it to the world. His house was torn down. His house was torn down. Jelly Roll Morton's house was torn down. Sidney Bechet's house. Who knows? Maybe Fast Domino's house would be torn down. You know, uh, Ellis Marcellus lives here. Maybe his house will be torn down at some point. Maybe, you know, who, who, who knows? Maybe one day we'll tear, that, tear down a Superdome. So when do we figure out what should stay, what should go, and we start talking about the value of it. Then the final piece of it, uh, I'm from the Gentilly area, although now I live uptown. Uh, my good friend lives in Gentilly. Gentilly, and Gentilly's kind of the, uh, one of the big, I would call it a buttress of this area that ends at the lake with the University of New Orleans. If you take a look at Gentilly and you're talking about the major blight issue, um, I know that it is second to New Orleans, to, to the Ninth Ward. So 
close second to the Ninth Ward. Ninth Ward is number one, Gentile is number two. And you're talking about a tremendous amount of blight that you know, can either go the positive way or go the negative way. Uh, the great thing about Gentile is it's a wonderful historic neighborhood with a good mixture of people. Uh, we have these universities here. You, you look at this part of town, it's amazing. You have Dillard University, you have uh, Delgado not far away, you have uh, Southern University of New Orleans, and you have the University of New Orleans. And then you have all of these properties sitting there, things that need to happen to you. You have Elysian Fields, which is an amazing street. It's the only street from the lake to the river. So you got all these possibilities, and then what do you get? You get check cashing place in the wrong place. You get a Walmart, a Walgreens that's built way, in my opinion, way too large. I don't know if you've seen this or not, but you know, it's like a massive Walgreens. I don't know what's wrong with the size before. Uh, maybe you get a Rite Aid right across the street, and you know, so all these decisions happen, and maybe you're just a person who purchased a home, and you know, all, the other thing is maybe, maybe uh, your neighbor decides to completely double the size of their house. This is something I've also noticed in Gentilly. I've noticed some people triple the size of their house. You know, on a block where houses now, uh, every other house is three times smaller. So I don't know if it's a good thing, I don't know if it's a bad thing, but I do know that these are the issues that we should be figuring out and the, the catch-22 of these types of organizations is sometimes when you're the home owner, you know, it's very frustrating when you say, look, man, I just want to tear down this wall and make a nice, I want to make a nice bath. Right, <laughs> right. You know, take a bath. Or, but it's also important to have the public be a part of the discussion because, you know, maybe you're tearing down something that's not just about you. Maybe it's about history. So and these are all questions for, uh, that affect the, da the daily lives of us and our pockets, and our investments, and what your degree is worth, and your time here, and you know, all these things, it really comes together. So architecture um, is, is something I think that we can pass by on a daily basis, but it's really, uh, like Kim was saying, it's really about engineering our lives and how successful uh, they are. So I, so I just kind of wanted to give that perspective when you, because I hear that complaint all the time about a lot of the historic perspective doing certain things, but then you drive by a house that's, you know, Pepto-Bismol pink in the middle of such a beautiful historic area, and you say, where was the board on that day? Well, you know, just, one, one way to look at this issue is to look at other cities, and some cities have figured this out very, very well. Uh, I don't know how it's playing out in New Orleans very well, but... For, for example? Uh, the, I think one of the best cities in the United States is Portland, Oregon. They, and it's not just through design controls, which is what you're talking about, it's also through zoning. And those are really two different, different exercises of government's control over private property. And have any of you been to Portland, Oregon? It's an amazing city. And it's a city that 30 years ago really wasn't so hot. It was actually in pretty rough shape in many ways. Uh, the downtown area was not vibrant. Uh, they do have a rich musical um, tradition in Portland, mm -hmm. as well as uh, some good food traditions themselves. But the city really was in decline, bad decline. And a number of civic leaders and citizen activists and the kind of community will of that place got certain pieces right from the scale of transit. They have an amazing light rail system throughout that community, as well as buses, very integrated. Lots of people ride bikes, lots of people walk, and you can bring your bike onto the bus or onto the light rail because so many people bike there. But also they did some zoning decisions to allow mixed use and higher density of development in the downtown area that has produced really one of the great success stories in the United States with an integration of transit, uh, larger scale of construction to be sure, but lots of mixed income opportunities within the downtown area as well. And I think they paid attention to their history too. Because if you go along the Willamette River, which is the river that goes through Portland, there's a whole kind of industrial warehouse landscape, just like we have here in New Orleans, that is now repurposed and revitalized. And they have a great arts district, just, just like we do, in our abandoned, uh, sort of transformed warehouse district. So they were able to get some big political decisions and big investment decisions that have really taken about 30 years to play out. And uh, they do have a design control process there. I'm sure that they have many of the same complaints. But the, the coincidence of planning, design control, historic preservation, and political leadership 
has produced some amazing results there. And there are other good examples in the United States, too. I think New Orleans is doing some good things. I, I've been meeting recently with a couple of the new members of the, the new mayor's team. Um, there's a gentleman named Bill Gilchrist, who is the uh, director of place-based planning. I think that's his title. And this is one of, the, one of the most distinguished planners in the United States. He came to us from Birmingham, Alabama. He's a fellow of the American Institute of Architects, which, which means he's uh, in a leadership position within the architectural profession. And uh, he understands that it's really a, a special moment in, in this city's history. Uh, I met another guy, or I've known him actually since I got here, Jeff A. Bear, who is a planner uh, from New Orleans, went off to ed get educated, came back, and now he is uh, director of the Blight program for the mayor. And he's the guy behind this big Blight announcement that came out. Right. And there's uh, several others in this kind of brain trust that will start to make a very big difference very quickly, I believe. Well, you know, you take up in the last month, I uh, was in Portugal, Lisbon, Portugal, and then went to a couple of different places in Brazil. Lisbon's a great example. It's a wonderful example. Now, you take Lisbon, which it's not doing so great financially. Right. Designed really well. So how does, it, how does it make a difference? Well, if you're in Lisbon and you don't have a lot of money, you can have a quality experience. And I recommend that if you ever were looking to go somewhere on a vacation. And you could do Lisbon, I think, if you can get there relatively cheap once you're there. What you eat, where you stay, what you do will work well for you. Now, you go to Sao Paulo, Brazil, different kind of experience, uh, just in terms of the transit system. Uh, there are so many buildings. I believe it is something like 11 million people living in one city in Sao Paulo. Right. It's 14 million, I believe, when you get outside of the greater city. In that city, everybody's driving. Everybody. So it will literally take you two hours to go 10 minutes. <laughs> I mean, and there, there's just one massive problem. Right. Uh, you take a look at China. Uh, when that, a couple years ago, remember, the, the train transit system broke down and a million people couldn't get home for a holiday. So, you know, you look at how we, we socially not just engineer what's important, what the priority is, because I think in Brazil they're making a good bit of money. I don't know where on the priority system is the transit system right now. Uh, when I kept asking folks about, like, when, when are y'all going to, I know y'all are making a lot of money here, what are y'all going to do about the transit si system? It's not high on a priority list, but I think also, just in terms of quality of life, I think what people don't really get sometimes is, is not just when a place is doing well while, why you want it to be designed well and why you want to care, it's when you hit the rough patch. Mm -hmm. In New Orleans, we have mm -hmm. a, a, the great benefit of having so much investment being spent. No city in the world enjoys a forever of you know, monetary success. Uh, as a matter of fact, we know historically that if you have great success monetarily at some point, you will have some level of failure. Uh, and that's when I think the design is so important because the quality of life shouldn't dissipate with, you know, uh, something moving or something changing. And what I think we've seen with Detroit and what we've seen with other places is one, uh, one thing happens and the entire city just falls apart, you know. Uh, and I think uh, New Orleans has, has been an example of working against the odds really well. But I think this is the type of thing of why, why you really want to, um, you know, I want to encourage you guys to really be involved and get and understand it and want to know that it's not just up to Ken Schwartz to be the smartest guy in the room on it. And he is the smartest guy, I believe, in the room on it. But he can only do so much if, if we're not appreciative of the work uh, that he and his team are doing and we're not invested involved uh, involved in it because things happen all the time like a Walgreens you know they'll just build one four times the size and I have no idea yeah. how that how that happened any other questions for Dean Schwartz yes yes um, about the Walgreens I completely agree I live a few blocks from there and it looks good it looks nice but it's too big it really is um, I had a question about volunteering for the urban build houses. Yeah. Uh, is it exclusively for your students, or can like the, uh, other students or people in the city volunteer? Help? During the academic year, it's it's definitely for our students because we've got our hands full teaching them and and doing things with them on the programs. We're trying to figure out ways to make the summer period, which is not a good time to be out building buildings, but there's lots that we do that are uh, planning oriented and smaller scale design build in the summers. 
Our big problem is that we've been so successful that we've got so much to do and so few people to organize it and manage it as a process. Literally, the three people I showed you are the people. Actually, I just added a fourth staff person. But I, I, we really need to have a whole enterprise going to make this happen. I think there's money out there to make it happen. I need to find a space. I'm actually trying to get a space on O.C. Haley Boulevard that would put our operation more centrally within the community. Right now, we have one little office in our uptown campus. And then we have satellite work all around the community. The short answer is that the opportunities are very limited for people outside. Uh, but I'm trying to figure out ways, especially in the summertime, that we could make this a more um, inclusive operation. We have lots and lots of people who would like to partner with us. The model we've done so far is we've set up relationships with other enterprises. There's a group called Design Corps based in Raleigh, North Carolina. You know AmeriCorps, which uh, started under uh, President Clinton? That program has been appropriated by this group of architects and designers. It's called Design Corps, which is a nonprofit that does uh, very affordable housing all across the Northeast and even some work down here as well. The guy that runs it grew up here in New Orleans. And um, you know, he, he comes back here every summer and does a project, usually a small scale project with about 12 or 14 of his volunteers. They're not students. They're volunteers who want to get involved in something here in New Orleans. And we host them. We give them studio space and shop space. And uh, you know, he's a friend of ours. And so they've been coming back every summer for four years. So it's really more at the scale of connections to other institutions, usually either institutions of higher education, or in the case of Brian Bell, this, this man, uh, he's got this, his own nonprofit that he goes and does work like this here and in Biloxi and other places as well. So I think one of the things you can do is probably uh, send Dean Schwartz an email. And he could probably, if you're interested in doing that type of work, probably refer you to some other people. Yeah, you should. K. Schwartz at Tulane.edu. Uh, K. Schwartz, it's uh, spelled funny. There's only one vowel in there somewhere. It's uh, S-C-H-W-A-R-T-Z. Another thing is, of course, when my website does become operable again, you will be able to just talk directly to Dean Schwartz. He'll be able to blog along with you. I don't know if you've been informed, but we have uh, all the students are required to blog. Oh, that's good. I didn't know You that. have an opportunity to blog along with Great. them. And I also would like to offer up an opportunity perhaps for maybe a few of your students from Tulane to join in. They'll be able to watch this. Yeah, that'd be great. Uh, and maybe they, we can make some pages, uh, some accounts for them, and they can actually blog on this specific su subject, and we can have a great. special interaction. I would like to put one carrot caveat out for you guys. Uh, I'm having a housewarming party, which is going to be pretty off the chain. <laughs> so we're going to have some pretty good food, great music. Uh, but it's going to be for an extreme limited amount of people. So I'm going to take the two best blogs <laughs> and the two best Twitter and Facebook things from today, from this session. Uh, and I'm going to offer the same thing for your students. Great. The two best. And uh, you will be invited to come to my house and party along with us for my housewarming party, which will be taking place in the next few weeks. Can I compete too? You're already on the oh, list. Okay, good. <laughs> <laughs> By the way, I have, a, I have a static blog, which is not really a blog. But if you want to look on the Tulane School of Architecture website, uh, from time to time, I write something uh, that strikes my fancy. And it's not an interactive blog. But I realized that when I started as dean that this was a whole new experience for me and for my wife. Um, so I thought it would be good to write things from time to time. The very first one was called Imagining New Orleans. And you can go backwards in my archive of blogs. And you know, I write about something interesting that our students have done or an interesting lecturer and any topics that are on my mind at a, at a certain moment. So if you're interested, take a look at that. You can find it off of the Tulane School of Architecture homepage. At the bottom, there's a little link that says Dean's Block. And it's important because I like to let students and parents and, and others in the community know what I'm thinking. And you have to look for it. But if you find it, and I've gotten a lot of good responses about it. I don't have the courage to make it interactive yet. <laughs> uh, that, that's the next step. Yeah. Well, But you're, takes... you're braver than I am. Well, well, we can actually link that on, uh, on the page where Dean Schwartz is, so we'll put that up there. Let's get down to some last questions, so let's make them quick. Yes? Um, during the slideshow, you mentioned that uh, the Urban Build Project liked to experiment with new materials. Yes. I was wondering if y'all had ever thought about doing something like the Connex Box Project in Florida, the hurricane with that. buildings. They're making buildings out of Connex boxes, you know, the 
big boxes? The oh, the shipping containers. Mm -hmm. Yes, actually, we have a project that we're about to start with shipping containers. There's a whole genre of architecture <laughs> dealing with shipping containers for good reason, because it's a very, very uh, efficient structure. And they're all over the place, and they're cheap. Um, we've got one project we're thinking about doing as a student design competition to explore what we could do using that technology and using those resources. Another one that's really interesting, my wife is an architect as well. Her name is Judith Kennard, and she won a design competition uh, this summer for steel SIPS panels, SIPS Structurally Insulated Panels, SIP. And it's a company here in New Orleans called Ocean Safe, and they produce a very, very good product that's e ecologically sustainable, very efficient um, in terms of its um, uh, properties. And they commissioned, or they asked a number, probably about a dozen top architects here in New Orleans to come up with a plan for um, housing, disaster recovery housing. And it's um, the one that's going to, that won, which is my wife's project, is being built as a demonstration on uh, Carrollton, uh, property on Carrollton, that they're going to build one of them. But they have contracts with the Defense Department and the State Department. And I think they're doing, they're going to do hundreds of these in Haiti and in Afghanistan. And it's, a, a, it's a, a house that's designed to be off the grid. It collects its water, it produces its own energy, and it can do that because it's so efficient in terms of its ecolo ecological properties. So that's actually a project that my wife did with another colleague, Tiffany Lin, as an independent design project. But our students do these kinds of projects frequently as well when there's interesting things that they can explore with new technologies. Uh, I believe you can find that project on my website as well because we uh, were delighted that she won that that project, and now they're building the first demonstration of it very quickly. Yes, ma'am. Um, with the houses that you built in Central City, like my friend purchased the one on Dryads, and it has a lot of really great design features, like the cross flow that comes through, like more yeah, environmentally. Yeah, the ventilation works very well. It's more environmentally responsible features, yeah. I guess. Um, but their house, aesthetically, is very mid-century among a bunch of very older shotgun houses. Yeah, that's so true. Is this purely like an, was it just an aesthetic Partly. design or, or is it, does that design actually fit into some of the requirements or practicality of the We find that a lot of people, there are some people, and it's in the TV series, some people really hate our houses because they're <laughs> contemporary and other people think, you know, it's the 21st century and they also understand students. I understand students too. The students who design these want to do something within the traditions but they want to experiment. They want to do something that's of the time. And I think there are parallels in music that, that, you know, I think great musicians are not just about accepting the status quo and going with tradition alone. But great musicians also understand tradition and they work with that as a foundation of where they proceed. And designers, creative writers, architects, uh, anyone, op people in dance, Anybody who is in a creative discipline, I think, understands that it's actually a play and a tension between those two things, tradition and innovation. Uh, our students understand it very intuitively. And, and if we told our students, you have to do a house that looks like a traditional New Orleans shotgun, they would say, forget it. That's, that's not what they're, they're here to study. They want to learn about those traditions, learn the best that they can from those traditions. And if they're interested in doing a strict preservation project, which we also do, that's a different proposition, and, they, and we do those kinds of projects too. But when they're designing fr something from scratch on a corner site in Central City, they're going to try to think of how they can do it in a way that's actually making a statement and, and not just sort of sitting in the background. But we've gotten a lot of flack about that. A lot of the uh, old guard New Orleans <laughs> folk really don't like our houses because they think that they're not paying enough homage to the great <coughs> vernacular traditions of our residential building stock which is true. New Orleans has one of the greatest housing traditions in this country. It's amazing. And the, and the range of opportunities that come about through these traditions is truly remarkable. We sort of take it for granted here, I suspect. But it's a tradition that comes from the West Indies and from other parts of the world. And it's very effective in terms of dealing with our climate. Um, but actually, we, we like to have air conditioning now. And that wasn't true in the 19th century. So things have changed. Our students have changed and all sorts of new things are possible as a result of that. Does your, does your friend like the house? Yeah, they love it. It's really beautiful. It's good. It's cool. That, that's what matters. Um, 
Now, I know uh, European cities are a lot older than American cities, but after traveling in Europe, I have come to the conclusion that there are a lot less landmark buildings in the U.S. cities today. And I was wondering, I mean, maybe I'm just not looking in the right places, but do you think that there's too much functionalism in architecture today and not enough art as a general rule? That's a loaded question. Uh, when you say landmark, what do, what do you mean? Just for my own purpose. Historically significant buildings? Well, historically significant buildings, and I mean, like in Prague, you have the Fred Ginger building right. that dancing okay. house, just like. Yeah. Uh, you know, there's a whole, there are a lot of factors behind your question, and I think your question's, you know, a good one. One of the factors is the whole concept of property rights plays out in a very different way in the United States because of our Constitution than in Europe. I mean, if you, let's say you fly into any city in Europe, almost any city, it's not unusual, I'll use Madrid as an example, it's not unusual for you to be flying in and you see absolutely beautiful, pristine farmland up until about eight miles outside of the center of the city. And you know the story of the United States, and, and it's true here in New Orleans just like any place else, that our historic cores have no longer maintained their integrity as the real centers of the community. The communities have sprawled. And that's largely because of our tradition of property rights that, that actually says, well, if I own this property, I really should be able to do with it what I want. So I think the issue of, of how it plays out in terms of landmark buildings and the investment in the cores of cities plays out in totally different ways in Europe than they do here, than it does here in the United States. Now, I'm not arguing that we should be a, a, the same as, as uh, Prague or the same as Madrid. But some of those qualities of making political decisions and financial decisions as a body politic, as a, as a, as a, a group of people, really would help us if we had the ability to do that in some instances. And then in the communities that have done this, uh, you know, center cities of places like Charleston, South Carolina, with a great strong mayor. A lot of times there's a strong mayor involved in this story. Uh, Chicago, Mayor Daley has been phenomenally successful in Chicago. And it's not that they don't have some of the same problems and challenges that we have here, but they have a greater degree of the quality that you're describing of a kind of historic core and a real cultural attachment to the significance of architecture within that. I mean, I think New Orleans, Chicago, Portland, a few other American cities have that. Baltimore, parts of Baltimore are amazing. Um, but actually, we're the exception that proved the rule, I think, that let, proves the rule. Let me add that um, I don't think it's only a design issue. I think that's why this course is important. It's just the challenge with focused education. As long as uh, we continue to uh, accept focused education, we're going to have a continued decline of priorities, and that's what you see going on. So you don't see th you don't see the same intent with design that you saw a hundred years ago. Period across the board. Why? Some would say it's because of Lowe's. You know, I was at Lowe's two days ago, and I went and picked out my own faucet. <laughs> you know, so some say it's that. Some say it's uh, that, you know, architects do, does what an architect does, the engineer does what the engineer does, and I'm, I'm the business guy. The financial planner does that, and a finance guy doesn't know Frank Lloyd Wright. He doesn't know Frank Gehry. Mm -hmm. um, and that wouldn't have been the case 50 or 60 years ago. So it's not just a design issue. I think it's a larger priority issue, and I think with focused education, if, we, if we're not concerned, then things happen like the Walgreens gets three times the size. And it's, nobody... You know, it's, it's, it's interesting, in a number of European countries before the Euro came on board, um, architects were on bills. I mean, Alvar yeah. Aalto is a great Finnish architect, and he was on the equivalent of the $20 bill in Finland. Uh, in Italy, in the Lira notes, um, Palladio, Andrea Palladio, who's a great Renaissance architect, was on one of their most important bills. And it's because kids learn about them. They learn about great musicians as a fundamental part of their elementary school on up. And it becomes part of the whole cultural expectation of that, of that situation. Now, I'm, I'm actually optimistic because I think design increasingly matters within the United States today. And it has to do with the imperative of sustainable design, the fact that we have to be operating with a much greater consciousness about the energy we consume. It happens because there are places that are pockets of excellence. Um, the communities I just mentioned, including New Orleans, that have a great deal of consciousness about their identity, those are places that matter, and they, they're places to be treasured. 
Uh, so design is part of that mix. And frequently there is a connection in these communities between architecture and music as well. Oh, big time. Um, and Chicago is probably the best example, you know, second to New Orleans in, in this regard. I mean, Chicago is a great American city in terms of architecture, art, music, and the whole relationship between the city and its urban landscape. And I, I'm very excited by what I saw Mayor Daley do. He's just stepping down as mayor, but he put together an extraordinary track record of leadership that helped to bring a number of these elements together, museums, economic development. Well, He's then truly also, one of the great mayors in this country. And you're also talking about the political, which is, I had a lot of flack from folks when they look at, looked at our syllabus and they see, okay, you have James Carville and Mary Matlin. This is a cultural, this is a class on discourse on culture. But as we keep hearing, all of these things kind of come full circle. Uh, the mayors, typically if you're going to be building something in the city, the museum, the public museum, the public library, the public whatever, it's the mayor that's going to make it happen. So the mayors become kind of like the chief architects mm -hmm. of the American landscape. Uh, there, we live in cities, we don't really live in states. So the mayors become a lot more important when we're talking about really giving people daily uh, assets. So hopefully all of this stuff is starting to tie together for you, you guys in a certain kind of way. I'm going to take one last question for the, for the dean. Yes, ma'am. Um, shortly after Katrina, Tulane School of Architecture did a redesign for a particular street it was Calhoun Street between Fountain Blue and, and Claiborne, and they sent everything, sent things out to all of the property owners in there. I have a rental in there in that area, and um, they had a beautiful redesign for a lot of the houses. And they said that you know in the future you're going to be contacted because we're going to look for ways to help you put this to what this area could be. Did that just fall by the wayside? Because I haven't heard I don't anything know. about I it. I hadn't heard of that project, but I can find out. Do you know who the, the faculty members involved with were? I, I really don't. It's, it's been probably Fair three enough. and a half, four years. Send me an email well, before you were here, and it was, yeah. it was, a, it was a lovely idea yeah. to take that area, which has a little bit of commerce, a lot of rental, a lot of owner-occupied, and some things that haven't even yet been touched since Katrina. I'll try to find out. I don't know who is behind it, but if I can find out, I'll let you know. <laughs> Uh, it sounds like a good project. A lot of our projects take a long time to come to fruition. We, we um, you know, I'm on the board of the Priestley School for Architecture and Construction, and that started in the Carrollton neighborhood. It's moved around a few places, and we're still trying to find a permanent home for this school. It's an open enrollment charter school uh, with a great principal, Michelle Biegas, and a, a number of great people teaching there. So it's a great operation. It's really important for the city, we think. But we have yet to find a permanent home. It's really the next big challenge that we have. Nonetheless, their scores are going up. They're doing a great job. And it's a unique high school in New Orleans because it brings design into the education of the 9 through 12 opportunities for these kids. Uh, I took Congressman Gao to see this school because uh, I went up to Washington to meet him. And he was really interested in what we're doing, which was good. And I brought him and showed him uh, Holly Grove and Priestley, and he and I gave the, uh, did the award ceremony for uh, Priestley that uh, last fall, and it was quite moving. He was very, um, very articulate, talked a lot about how education is the key to everything. And uh, he actually quoted President Obama a lot, and if you didn't know it, you would have guessed he was a Democrat, because <laughs> he was definitely um, playing up the connection to Obama, which I thought was smart on his part. Didn't work out for him. Did, uh, it doesn't look like it will work out for him. We'll Obama see. Obama didn't endorse him. I know. I know. <laughs> He's not going to. Hey, I've got one plug before I leave. I've got some information for you if you're interested on the front table here. The white book is a selection of some of our projects from the Tulane City Center. You're welcome to take one. It's about 30 of our 60 projects with a little map in the centerfold that shows you where they all are if you ever want to visit them. The, the other document is a newsletter that, that I produce every summer, I've done two so far, that really captures highlights of things that are happening at the School of Architecture in the previous year. And then the third one is a brand new graduate program I started called a Master of Sustainable Real Estate Development program. It's a one-year master's for anyone with a baccalaureate degree, it already has a bachelor's degree. And the idea there is I want to connect people up with business skills, entrepreneurship, and sustainable design, uh, particularly as it relates to regenerating cities. Uh, this is certainly an issue for New Orleans, but it's an issue for many American cities. 
So I want people to come into our program. I'm modeling it with about 30 students coming in in the entering class. It'll be a national program. We'll have people from all over the country. And uh, I think it's an important niche that we're going to fill. There are similar programs around the country. Uh, none of them has the word sustainable in it. But uh, MIT, Columbia, Cornell, and USC, University of Southern California, all have one-year master of uh, real estate programs. Ours is the only one that's in New Orleans. Mm -hmm. And ours is the only one that has sustainability built into the title. Because we think that real estate development for the next century, at least the next 50 years, has to be about regenerating cities. It's not about greenfield development. It shouldn't be about greenfield development. It should be about how do we energize our cities with intelligent, sustainable development? And how can you make money doing it? Because I think it's uh, empowering for people to understand some of the creative financing tools and some of the ways through tax credits, public-private partnerships, and other mechanisms that are available to you to actually turn good design into money. And money either for your own benefit or for the benefit of a nonprofit. Because basically, nonprofit re uh, real estate development and for-profit re real estate development operate on fundamentally the same principles. It's just how you put the packages together and who the client is. So we're going to start this up in June of 2011. The awesome. Tulane board approved it about a month and a half ago. And um, I think we're going to fill a really interesting niche by doing this program. I hired a great director. Her name is Sandy Stroud. And she is a Tulane alumna, a licensed architect, and a graduate of MIT's graduate program. And she wanted to get back here to New Orleans. So um, I brought her back. And she's running this program for me. Uh, I would uh, add, remind you guys that two of you will be coming to my house for a party, depending on uh, how well you blog uh, and Facebook and Twitter. Uh, also, we are going to be doing, I'm, I'm the director of the Jazz Institute here, that's what I do, uh, and we're going to be throwing a thing called a bubble queue, barbecue and champagne. Wasn't my name, but I'm looking forward to it. Uh, and we will be looking for some folks to volunteer. And uh, if you volunteer, that's another way you can make it to my house uh, for the party. So talk to Stephanie uh, if you guys are interested in that. Do you want to add anything to that? Yeah, who wants to blog it? Uh, again, I'll put all the information for the bubble with you on there. And the, just send me an email if you're able to volunteer. And as we know exactly what we need, I'll divide everybody up. Excellent. Well, uh, this is. Uh, uh, a session that I've learned the most so far, and I really appreciate someone who's obviously extremely busy at a completely different institution taking this time to come and share, valuable time to come share with us today. So I think we should give one more round of applause for Dean Kim Schwartz. Thanks. Thanks.